try that. I love you with the love of the Lord. Yes, I love you with the love of the Lord. I can see. You see, I didn't even know it, but we finally got it. That's your new song for the opening song, okay? Okie dokie. Hey, we got an old song that I don't even know if I know it. <laughs> We're going to try and sing it. If you know it, you can sing with us. Come on, Bill. It's, uh, you know which one it is? You need a, you need a piece of paper? Oh, Bill. Okay, we need Bill. <clears throat> You know what, preacher? You find it. Just catch up with us. <laughs> Let's see, who can I else I get out there? <laughs>
We just made that one up. No. Hey, now it's your turn. If you will stand up, get you a red book, and turn to 240. We're going to sing this song that's called The Lily of the Valley. 240. 240. Get your breath. <laughs> we'll slow it down a little bit. The next song, turn to 244. Y'all know that one? You don't know that one? 244? You know that one, Kathy?
I'm ready to go right now. But Lord, we come to you tonight thanking you again for your goodness, your mercy, Lord, your love that you've shown on us today. It's been a good day, Lord, and we thank you for it. I pray for all those folks, Lord, that couldn't be here tonight, whatever reason may be, Lord, that you just lift them up and give them the strength, Lord, to come back the next time. I pray for our pastors that you're going to come up here in a few moments and tell us the things you want us to hear. And if you would, Lord, fill him up with everything, Lord, that we can stand tonight, Lord. So we're going to thank you for that. And Lord, tonight I want to tell you again that I do love you, Lord, and I do pray that you forgive me where I fail you so many times, and I'm sure that's all of our prayer here tonight, too. But Lord, if you would, would you go with us tonight? So we're going to ask this in that name, your son's name, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. We got enough people to help you down here. I got here. two gentlemen here. Well, uh, you got one gentleman and no men. <laughs> yeah, and I'm old man. Yeah, you are. <laughs> I started to say something else, but I won't. I'll leave that alone. Well, it's good to be back in God's house. Amen. Amen. We're back doing our chronological New Testament Bible study tonight. We're going to be in a brand new book, the Epistle of Paul to the church of Colossae. So we'll be in Colossians. If you want to go there, and once you find that in your uh, chronological New Testaments that we gave you, and if you don't have one of those, the regular Bible will work any time. And then once you get there, if you want to flip back over to the book of Acts, chapter 20, hold your, I know you've got more than one finger, I've watched most of you eat, so. Put one there and go back to Acts chapter 20, okay? Because Acts chapter 20 is our the last part of our history lesson that we've gotten that carried us to. Uh, um, yes, Tony? Uh, we'll get to 28. I'm, uh, uh, we're going to be in 20 just making some notes for you, but we'll restart our reading in Acts 28. But 
once everybody gets settled in. But uh, it's a joy to have you here in the house of the Lord with us tonight. So pray that God will encourage you by his word. One of the things about the history of the Bible, it has a great deal to do that we have a history book, at least partially in the book of Acts, that helps guide us as far as the, chron- the chronology of the New Testament. And one of the reasons it's vital to, to study the New Testament chronologically is we get the contextual value of how it was actually written. It was written to us, it was written for us, but it's, the Bible means what it says and says what it means, and it's not of any private interpretation. But the reason we get so many diverse ideas about what the Bible says is that we have a tendency to study it in piecemeal, and uh, we use what we call the cut-and-paste theology, you know, <laughs> just drop, drag and drop, whatever you want to call it. But if you stay in the context, it's easier to understand what the Word of God says, and that's what we want to know. We want to know what God says so that we, we don't know what someone says that God says. We want to know what God says. And that within itself would lend itself to an encouraging display of the Scriptures itself. In Acts chapter 20, we had talked about the last time we went to the book of Acts, we were getting the background of the book of Romans and the book of Second Corinthians, which was written only about three months apart, uh, somewhere around 57 A.D. Now, remember, the church is only like 27 years old at, at here in Acts chapter 20. Uh, it was born in Acts A.D. 30, um, and now it's in, in Acts chapter 20, it's in uh, A.D. 57. And verses 1 through 3 gave us the background for 2 Corinthians. We'll, uh, we'll, we won't read these. Well, you've already read them. We read them when we launched over into the book of Romans. We just completed the book of Romans after finishing the book of 2 Corinthians. And by the way, that's how they are lined up chronologically. Uh, in your regular Bible, in my Bible, what you'll find the book of Acts, the book of Romans, the book of First and Second Corinthians. And if you'll notice carefully, they are arranged in the length of the letters. The longer letters are up near the front, and the shorter letters are near the back, as far as the, as the epistles of Paul, ending with the book of Jude, which is only one chapter just prior to the book of the Revelation. So what we're doing is looking at uh, the books as they were written, as the date they were written, and trying to give you a little bit of history uh, that pertained to them. Now, between Acts chapter 20, if you flip through your Bible, you'll find that now uh, Paul is headed to uh, all the way to Troas and the Melinus, and he's, he meets with the Ephesian elders in chapter 20, and then in chapter 21, he leaves there on his voyage to Jerusalem. Now, Paul is going to Jerusalem to celebrate the feast days, and then he arrives in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 21, and then uh, he, he's arrested in the temple. There's a riot there because he goes in with what's Actually, is perceived to be an unclean man. Of course, was not. But nevertheless, he, he was arrested. And then in chapter 22, Paul is allowed to give a, converse, a testimony of his conversion. And the latter part of that, Paul gives his, gives his testimony about him being sent to the Gentiles. And then he goes before the Roman court in the latter part of chapter 22. And then in chapter 23, Paul is speaking to the Sanhedrin Council. By the way, you understand that the the Sanhedrin Council was not only a governing council for the Jews, but they were also the religious council for the Jews. So it was, in in essence, uh, Israel was intended to be, uh, rather than a democracy or a republic, as we think of, it was intended to be a theocracy, a nation under God. And that's what it was intended to be in God uh, when, when all of a sudden Israel decided they wanted a king over them like the other nations and God allowed them to have that to their detriment. But in Acts 23, there was a plot to kill Paul. Paul was seemed to be always, as I've often said about Paul, such an unusual ministry that he had. Whenever he went into a city, he just went on and checked into the local county jail. That's where he was going anyway. There wasn't any need checking into the Holiday Inn. He was going to be arrested and wind up in jail anyway. How would you like to think that every time you witnessed on the streets, you'd go to jail? And by the way, just, just recently I read of two preachers being jailed uh, because they were preaching the Bible in a certain city. I won't mention the city. But nevertheless, and they have been they have been released. And there was a plot to kill Paul. And then in chapter 24, Paul was uh, imprisoned in Caesarea. And as he was on trial, put on trial there before before the court. And Paul's been tried for treason, more or less, against the king. 
And, of course, he goes before uh, Felix and Drusilla, and then he appears before Festus in chapter 25, and then Agrippa and Bernice. He goes through all the hierarchy, all, all the powers that be, and he defends himself before Agrippa in chapter 26. If you want to just uh, read his, his testimony before Felix there in verse 12 of chapter 26 and following, you'll find that that's where he was testifying and defending himself before Felix. And then he, the prisoner set sail there. By the way, he would have been tried and convicted there, but he appealed to Caesar. And of course, someone said, how can you appeal to Caesar? And Paul says, I'm a Roman citizen. And he was a Roman citizen uh, legally. Of course, he was, he was not. He was a Jew. He was a citizen primarily of Jerusalem, but he had also been granted citizenship. So he appealed to Caesar to be tried under Roman law. And that's in 27 when they set sail uh, for it's amazing. Here he goes sailing to be tried, and the worst storm that's recorded in Scripture is found here uh, in chapter 27 when they were on their way. They were shipwrecked, and of course Paul talks about his shipwreck being shipwrecked four times. And then in chapter 28, verse 16, where we'll begin tonight, uh, he arrived in Rome. See, I, you thought I was going to never get to a place where you could actually read Scripture, right? But I wanted to catch you up as we go through that. That's the history and by the way, after the book of Colossians, we'll lose our history book. We won't have any more indicators as far as, spirit, as scriptural history book. Then we'll have to depend a great deal. You need to know that as Acts closes out, it's going to close out in about A.D. 63. And, uh, and from that point forward, uh, we'll find that the books will line up as we gave them to you. You'll find that in 63 A.D., we're going to find the books that were written at that time will be the book of Colossians, the one we're going to tonight, and the book of Ephesians, the book of Philemon, and the book of Philippians, all written about the same time in the same year. Let's put it that way as far as we can determine. And then there's only three other books outstanding once we get through this, and that's the book of 1 Timothy, Titus, and 2 Timothy. 1 and 2 Timothy was written in 65 A.D., and then, of course, 2 Timothy was written in 67 A.D., and we'll close the epistles of Paul out. That doesn't mean there are other writings, and we'll get into the general epistles when we get to them. All right, you've, ever, you've understood everything. Anybody have any history questions? Do ask the historian, not a theologian, okay? All right, let's look, at, let's look in chapter 28, verse 16, because this, this little part of the book of Acts is the only background that we have biblically on the writing that's going to con really contribute to the book of Colossians. Beginning in verse 16 of chapter 28, the book of Acts, and when he came to Rome, remember, the letter that Paul wrote to Rome, he wrote to a church that he did not establish, but a church that he sent others to Rome to establish before he got there. And we read through that when we read, uh, read earlier in the book of Acts in chapter 20. In verse 16, when he came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard, but Paul was suffered to dwell by himself with a soldier that kept him. And it came to pass that after three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together. And when they were come together, he said unto them, Men and brethren, though I have committed nothing against the people or customs of our fathers, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who, when they have examined me, would not would have let me go because there was no cause of death in me. But when the Jews spake against it, I was constrained. Now remember... He's talking to the chief of the Jews, and he says, I would have been let go except for you guys and the people of the Jews because they, I was constrained to appeal unto Caesar, not that I had ought to accuse my nation of. For this cause, therefore, have I called for you to see you and to speak with you because that for the hope of Israel I am bound for this chain, with this chain. And they said unto him, we neither receive letters out of Judea concerning thee, neither any of the brethren that came showed or spake any harm of thee, but we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest, for as concerning this sect, talking about Christianity, we know not, or we know that everywhere it is spoken against. And, and by the way, that hasn't changed a whole lot, has it? Sometimes, especially when it comes to uh, religiosity, and even in America today, it seems like we're kind of getting... A lot of heat, but that's okay. And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him to his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, 
persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets from morning till evening. I read that and I said, golly, these guys must have really been hungry. They sat there all day long. All day. If you sit one hour in church today, everybody's getting fidgety. So they were sitting there all day and all night. Why? They wanted to know the truth. Even the Jews who were searching and looking for the Messiah to come. And Paul had already proclaimed that Jesus, in fact, was the Messiah. He was the Yeshua HaMashiach that the, com- the common people were looking for, the Jesus the Christ. And so he had proclaimed that gospel to them. And he said, and some believed not. Some believed, verse 24, and some believed not. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed after that. Paul has spoken one word. Well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our father, saying, Go unto this people and say, Hearing, you shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing, you shall see and not perceive. For the heart of this people is wax gross or cold, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest, would they, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. Be it known, therefore, unto you that salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had reason, great reasoning among themselves. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came unto him. Right here in verse 30 is when a man named Epirus actually came to Paul and visited Paul here in the jail. And he actually left and went back to Colossae and started three churches in an area that was absolutely uh, given over to idolatry. And this is the, the beginning, if you will, of the foundation of the church at Colossae. And the Bible said that when they came unto him, verse 31, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. You know, when I read that, no man forbidding him, I was amazed that here he is in prison, and he had more liberty to preach in prison than he did on the streets. If he preached Jesus on the streets, they locked him up. So the best place he could be was in the prison where he could preach without any objection. So if you would, flip over to the book of Colossians, and we'll pick up the story. And by the way, the book of Colossians is probably one of the most Christ-centered epistles in the whole Bible. It has... More about the centrality of Jesus Christ as it relates to a relationship with God the Father. In fact, it's an absolute impossibility to have a relationship with God the Father except through the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So I hope you found your book, your page now, and you're ready to go in the book of, uh, book of Colossians. Colossians was founded by Epaphras. Uh, as the Bible tells us, and what we'll see momentarily in 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 itself, about 62 or 63, anywhere between 60 and 62 uh, A.D. And it was written about the same time, the book of Philemon, the book of Ephesians, and the book of Philippians. Of course, it was written while Paul was in prison. He was writing to the church of Colossae to encourage it. And there seemed to be one primary reason that Paul wrote the letter, as always with most of the letters of Paul, there, some of the false teachers had crept in to this small church. And by the way, Colossae was a small, only about 5,000 people in that whole, it was a village. It wasn't really a city, considered a city. And uh, out of that small group of Christians, Judaizers apparently had, had slipped in and began to talk about the law being an obligatory before salvation. And yet it was a strange kind of legalism because Gnosticism had sort of integrated itself into it. And Gnosticism, of course, is that, that form of, of teaching of, of special, special knowledge in order to know God. And then also it, it speaks a great deal of, of having this uh, consistent of this aesthetic ideas and, and the worship of angels and of, of intermediaries between God and man. And, and, of course, we're going to find that there's only one mediator between God and man. That's the man, Christ Jesus. And uh, that also includes any spiritual person on earth. I need to let you know that the only, the only people that, need, that you need or I need to get to God the Father is Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost and you. And that's it. You don't need someone between you and Him. You don't need a preacher to get you to heaven. 
You don't need the Pope to get you to heaven or anyone else. I'm not, not being discrepatory. I'm just saying. And they thought and they used this to, to begin to entice uh, these young Colossian believers. So Paul wrote the letter. And he begins, and instead of refuting it point by point, what he really does is he just dives in. And, and as we always know, the best way to refute anything counterfeit is just tell the truth. And if you have the truth, the counterfeit then is exposed. I've been told that what happens whenever people are having difficulty in banks and that they're having to learn how to, how to tell counterfeit bills that come into the, in the bank. Here's the way they do it. They are very, very familiar with what's real. So they don't need to know what the counterfeit looks like. They just need to know what the real thing looks like. And then they can tell the counterfeit. So beginning in chapter 1, verse 1, the book of Colossians, let's drop in and just uh, go verse by verse through this uh, small book. Of course, written by Paul, and he declares his office as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timotheus, our brother. This again, writing with Timothy was in the jail with Paul at the same time. He was visiting there with him. And so he says, I'm writing to the saints and the faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae. Now, these are not two different sets of people. These, these are, this is a com what we call a combination saying when he says this, the saints and the faithful. And the reason, uh, years ago when I read that word saints, I thought, well, boy, oh boy, it must be some kind of real, real up, up, up. Up the ladder in the church as saints, and I did not realize at that time that every born again believer is a saint. He's set aside, you know. You think about this, you know. Uh, saint Sammy. That goes over real good, doesn't it, Sammy? Uh, or either whatever your name may be, if you belong to Jesus Christ. The word comes from the root word sanctified, to be set apart. So the day that you become a Christian, or I became a Christian, either one of us, we're set apart. That means we're set apart from the world, we're set apart from hell, and in eternity, we're absolutely designated with an eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where the foundation for the Word came. So, he says, I'm writing to the saints, and the faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae. Look at that phrase, in Christ. That's one of the most profound statements in the Word of God, at least to my opinion. Here's why. Because... What happens when a person is born again, born from above, if you will, by the Spirit of God, he literally births us into the family of God by placing us in the body of Jesus Christ. Now, that is not physically, of course, but spiritually, we become a part of the body of Jesus Christ. He's the head. We are part of that body. Every born-again believer, we're all part of that body. I've always wondered if... How Have you ever noticed how Christians have a tendency to kind of war with each other? You know, there's one over here. we got our little bunch over here and little bunch over here. The body doesn't do that. If, can you imagine your body starting that all of a sudden? You wake up one morning and one ear's in battle with the other. You're in trouble, right? I have figured out, as I said before, that most Christians, I think, I know what part of the body they are. Their noses and tongues. Mm, they got their nose in everybody's business and their tongue is... Anyway, here's what happens. When we're placed in the body of Christ, then we become the arms and legs of Jesus Christ. We become what He uses to minister in this world. Every, every part of the body has a different ministry. And sometimes people get all hung up on their ministry and their ministry alone. There's more than one ministry in the body of Christ. And then we have this idea of these... I call it Christ, uh, cookie-cutter Christians. Uh, everybody thinks that we're all supposed to look alike. Thank God we don't all look alike. Aren't y'all glad of that? Look in the mirror and wonder about looking like your pastor. That would be a trip out of this world. So we're not supposed to all look alike. We're not supposed to all feel the same way about certain things. So we, are in, we don't lose our individuality. But we do in one sense is that we now become corporate together. So he says, I'm writing to those and reminding you that you're in Jesus Christ. You know what? I don't know about you, but I get a little bit happy when I think about things like that. I just haven't been saved long enough. I guess another 45 years or so about do it. Here's why. I cannot, uh, beyond me, get over the fact that God loved me enough to put me in His Son. What about y'all? This doesn't do something for you. It does for me, and I'm reminded of that. And he says, I want to remind you that you're in Christ Jesus. And he says, I'm which are all of those that are at Colossae. And he writes and says, Grace be unto you, and peace. And by the way, you can't have peace without grace. Grace is the progenitor that pushes us by with faith into the peace of living God. 
And what is peace? I, uh, we always have this, this, I guess everybody has a different rendering of peace. But really, the only way to be at peace with God and to have peace, the peace of God, is to be at peace with God. Now, to be at peace with God, there can't be anything between you and Him. Isn't that amazing? And the way to have nothing between you and Him is, first of all, allow the Lord Jesus Christ Himself as He paid the supreme price for every sin that we've ever committed. And so then once He forgives us of our sins, there's nothing between us and Him. And you say, well, wait a minute, I've sinned since I've been saved. I hope you've confessed it since you've been saved. And if you have and repented of it, then there's still nothing between you and Him. And the amazing thing is God doesn't count how many times you fall down. He counts how many times you get up. And as long as there's one more than the one you fell down. By the way, how many? I shouldn't do that. Oh, let's do it anyway. How many of you made a mess today already? Some of you aren't voting. You're lying. I know. Amen. We all know that we have the... (laughs) We, we have this sin nature about us. And by the way, there's never an excuse for sin, but we are sinners by nature. And the one thing that we've been given in the new nature is the ability not to sin. We don't have to sin. We sin because we desire to sin and because we surrender to what the flesh says. So he says, grace and be unto you in peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then Paul says, we give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. He's talking to that little church. And uh, I thought about this. I thought about how that Paul, before he began to write about any correction in the church that was going on, he said, I want you to know that I'm praying for you. You know, I, I believe this with all my heart. I believe that prayer will straighten out more people than all the preaching in the world. I want you to think about that. I don't want to dismantle uh, having the Word of God handle, but prayer is asking God to get involved in somebody's life. And I promise you that when God gets involved in somebody's life, He can do more for anyone than all the... We want, we want to debate with people. Well, let me tell you what's, what you're, where you're wrong. Well, let me tell you where I'm wrong if all I've got to do is try to cr- straighten you out. I'm wrong by not putting you in God's hand and letting Him straighten you out. Amen? And I wish you'd do the same for me. How's that? Amen? So He said, we pray for you, always for you, In verse 4, he said, Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have to all the saints. You know, it's an amazing thing in every letter of Paul's and every, in fact, every epistle and every book in the Bible. uh, After the Gospels, we find something, in fact, even before that, we find this, this thing is a requisite of salvation. Here's what I mean. You can't love God without loving your brothers and sisters. You can't do it. And by the way, I've heard people say, oh, I love all my brothers and sisters. Well, I tell you what, I don't know that I want you to love me if you treat everybody the way you do somebody. Amen. We're we're held accountable to that. And he said to this church, I want to give you a commendation because we understand that you have a great love for all the saints, every born-again believer. And in verse 5, he says, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven... Whereof you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. So there's, he, he puts two things together here that is always married in the scripture, and that's hope and faith. Whenever we have faith, and the word hope in the scripture isn't like, I hope it happens. Actually, it means a certain looking for, a waiting for it to happen. Not if it's going to happen, it's going to happen, and hope means that we're waiting for it to happen. So what he's saying is that is that that hope that is laid up for you in heaven is not a hope to go to heaven. Some people hope so, think so, maybe so, but the Word of God says in 1 John 5, 13, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. You have to never, ever doubt your relationship with God if you believe the Word of God. Amen? Isn't that somebody said, well, I, I hope I go to heaven. Well, I, listen, don't leave this building tonight till you know for sure. And you can know for sure by just asking the Lord Jesus Christ to be your Savior. Repent of your sins. And according to the Scriptures, he says that he'll save you. Listen to this. Which, he says, which is come, talking about the gospel, truth of the gospel, is coming to you as it is in all the world. 
and bringeth forth fruit, as it does also in you, since the day you heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. And you also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ. What a, what a powerful uh, commendation to be called a faithful minister of Christ. Uh, especially by Paul the Apostle. This was the highest commendation someone could get. And of course, Paul was commending uh, his brother simply because Ephesus had actually started the three churches. He had started this one in Colossae. He started, he started one in, and, um, also in Laodicea and one in Hierapolis. So he was the founder of those three churches. And he said, this man is a faithful minister of Christ. And he's for you, he's a faithful minister of Christ. In verse 8, he said, also de- who declared unto, you, unto us your love in the Spirit. For this cause, now he begins to get down to the teaching of the, of the epistle itself. We also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and desire that you might be filled with the knowledge. This is that Greek word, epinosis. It's not the word gnosis, it's the word epinosis, which means a revelation of God, not just an intelligent uh, determination of knowledge. He says, we want to see you filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Now, the word spiritual actually links both understanding and wisdom together. Uh, It's a corporate word or a corporate statement. So what he's saying, he's saying, we're praying or I'm praying that because they were dealing with the Gnostics and the Gnostics talked about special revelation from God. And what he was saying is he's saying, I'm praying that you'll get knowledge and wisdom and understanding directly from the voice of Almighty God. Now, folks, I want to tell you something. I pray that for you every week that we pass. Here's why. The only thing that we have to use in a battle in a world that's gone absolutely crazy is spiritual wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Why is that so important? I want to tell you what, if you listen to those around you, and be careful who you listen to, rather than listening to the voice of God as it comes through the Word of God, I can promise you, they turn, as well, the Bible tells it, they will call good evil and evil good. And that's where we are in a society that we're in today. Everything's okay. You know, whatever, if it feels good, do it. Let me tell you about doing what feels good. It gets you in a world of trouble. Why? Because I don't trust my feelings, and if you do, you need to check up from the neck up. Right? Because your head will get you in trouble. He said, I want to see you have that. I'm praying for you. Uh, And then in verse 10, he said that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. That's a common statement uh, given in all of Paul's epistles, is that you and I, as I said this morning in the message, you and I are representatives of Jesus Christ, good or bad. We are representatives of Christ. The word witness, I spoke to a young man the other day, he said, I just want to be a witness for Christ. Do you know what that means, the word witness? It comes from the Greek word martyrios, which means martyr. You want to be a martyr for Christ? Well, I just want to tell people about him. (laughs) Well, let me tell you something. To be a martyr or a witness for Jesus Christ, it actually takes A fact of not being sold on yourself, but being sold on Him. And that's being a witness for Christ. Whenever we step aside of ourselves, step outside of our own desires, and start telling people about Christ. I had someone tell me recently, well, I don't want everybody to think I'm a religious fanatic. Don't worry, they don't. One of the greatest commendations I think I've ever had is that I had a teacher right on one of our children's um, notes, and of course I was a school teacher at the time, she had no idea I could read the notes that she wrote, but I did. She said, well, her father is now a religious fanatic. I said, hallelujah, it's the greatest thing anybody's ever said about me. By the way, a fanatic is somebody all out for everything, one thing, amen? Well, I don't, I, I like to be tolerant. Yeah, let me, you, oh, I know what you're saying. You like to be open-minded, right? You know the closest thing to open-minded? Empty-headed. You better be careful if you open your mind to stuff. You can get in more trouble than you can get out of. Amen? But if you open your mind to the Word of God and have it to be your mentor, 
have it to be your guide, then you don't have to worry about getting in trouble with God. By the way, I'd much rather be in trouble with all of you than I had with him. Would you not? So he said, I want to see you increased in the knowledge of God. Uh, that you might walk worthy, verse 10, uh, of the Lord in all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to His glorious power. You see, Gnostics were teaching about extraordinary power of intermediaries. That getting, it, it was almost like voodoo in the church. You know, today we got these little mantras going in a certain church. If you say certain things, certain way, certain things will happen. Let me tell you what I can guarantee you. If you say things God's way, what he says will happen. And I would, and what he doesn't say won't happen. So we're trying to make God uh, dance to our tune rather than us taking his word as what it says. So he was teaching them, saying this. He said, you need to be strengthened with all might according to his glorious power under all patience. Whoa, he could have left that one out, could he not? And long suffering and with joyfulness. Now, wait a minute. Put those first two together patience and long suffering. Patience simply means waiting for God to complete whatever it is He's doing and not being in a hurry. That's why we're such a patient country. That's why we have minute markets on every corner. People paying three times the price to run in so they can run in and run out. It won't take but a minute to do it, but it's cost us three times. That, hello, how bright we are. Then the long suffering means to suffer, the word suffering, and over a long period of time. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm allergic to pain. When it comes to suffering, and I read this and I think, wait a minute, Lord. Now, it doesn't mean just, just human suffering. It means also putting up with a certain set of circumstances, but it also has to do with pain and suffering. And he says that we're to be long-suffering, and we're to do it joyfully. Just doing it would be amazingly amazing. Wouldn't it be amazing? But then to do it and be happy about it? My goodness. And he said, you do it by giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. You realize what that means? That means that everything that God has left in His Son, and by the way, He's placed all things under His Son's discretion, and He has become the judge of all nations and world. We become partakers of His goodness to all saints, even the apostles. We share the same thing that they have. To me, that's a magnificent statement. We share that inheritance with them. And then the Bible says that who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Um, do you know what that means when it talks about being translated from the darkness? I was talking with a young man the other day. I, I'm sorry, it was a young lady um, at jail. And she was addicted, terribly addicted to a terrible... By the way, there's so many things to be addicted out there too today. Amen? And it's, it's crazy. But this young lady was addicted to a, a very powerful, addicted uh, street drug. And uh, she was saying, you know, I just, I don't think there's any help for me. I was glad that I could tell her, according to the Word of God, that she could be delivered from the power of darkness. Amen. And by the way, I know I've heard so many, spent some two and a half years studying addiction and all that the psychologists and the, and the sociologists teach, and then you take it and you compare it with the Word of God. I'll never forget the first AA um, meeting I went to. Uh, they, they, everybody stands up and says, and I'm not being critical, by the way, anything that keeps you sober, if you've got a problem, you use it. And uh, they would stand up and say, I'm so-and-so and I'm an I, I, I'm alcoholic. And they'd say what they had to say and sit down. And they said, don't you have something to say? I said, well, yeah. And I stood up and I said, my name's Dennis and it's good to be here tonight. Well, everybody had a 911. Aren't you an alcoholic? I said, no, I'm an ex-alcoholic. Oh, you never get to be an ex-alcoholic. Well, I said, that's not what this book says. Delivered from darkness, amen. I refuse to say, by the way, all that is is just uh, had a young man want to be involved in the AIP program. He came to me and he said, I want to be involved in this addiction intervention program. I said, well, that's great. Yeah, we'll help you any way we can. He said, I need to let you know up front, though, I'm going to relapse. (laughs) 
I said, uh, why are you going to do that? I, he said, well, you know, that's what drug addicts do. We relapse. I said, well, if you're planning to relapse, there's no need for you to get into the addiction intervention program because what you're doing, you're giving you a doorway back into drugs. So anyway, deliverance means exactly that. You can be set free from the power of darkness. I believe that includes almost everything under the sun. And so he said, and we've been, we've been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. I, I want to give you a quick analogy. Do you believe Jesus would be hooked on drugs? Do you believe that he could actually, if he were, knowing that he never was, uh, do you think that he could overcome that addiction? Why, does he have the power to do that? If you're in him, would you not have that same power? Oh, settled. Keep it in your heart and mind. There's no need for you to understand. Well, uh, anyway, he said we've been translated into from darkness to light. How much difference is that? Now, it can't be any more separated from one kingdom to another and the kingdom of his dear son verse 14 he said in whom we have redemption through his blood even the forgiveness of sins and he said this son who is the image verse 15 and not a image you see the word the the definite article he is the image of the invisible god that literally is a powerful word it really is a photochoos and it literally means he's like a photocopy, except he's the real thing. He's a, he is the image of the invisible God. By the way, I need to tell you, God's not invisible anymore. He's been seen. He was seen on planet Earth for 33 and a half years. And he went by the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's God has been made visible. Remember when the Bible says that God was now made manifest? Well, it's John chapter 1, verse 1 of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then it goes to verse 14. It says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. God became visible. Now, the next time somebody tells you, Well, God's invisible. Uh, no, no, not always. We know that. And so he says, and he said, The firstborn, this Jesus, is the firstborn of every creature doesn't mean that he was born first as being created. It means that he is the initiator of birth in every creature. He is that firstborn, if you would. And then verse 16, for by him, by the Son. Let me, let me stop before I get to this one. How many of you, when you think about the creation, see God the Father reaching down and scooping up a handful of clay? By the way, the word Adam means I have so many people say, well, Adam was white, and Adam was black, and Adam was, Adam was red. How do I know that? <laughs> because his name, Adam, means red clay. Settled? So the next time you get into one of these racial things back and forth, just hush your mouth, open it, and, and let everybody know how ignorant you are. Hush. The truth of the matter is, he came from red clay. That's what the name comes from, Adam. When he created Adam, you, you, you look down and you think in your mind, seeing God the Father uh, forming him up the way he wanted him in his own image and then breathing the breath of life into him. Well, it wasn't God the Father. It was God the Son. Look at this verse and it'll tell you in verse 16. For by him, the Son, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by Him and none of it belongs to us. They gave me a deed to property one time and I said, I don't need this. They said, why? This is yours. I said, you've got to be kidding yourself. Watch if I don't pay taxes who it belongs to. But really, all things are going back to Him. And He is, verse 17, before all things and by Him all things consist. Someone said, we're going to remove God from our schools. And almost, almost made me want to chuckle. I thought, I think you're going to have a bigger job on your hand than you think. How would you like to have to put God out of anywhere? Because don't you understand, if God turned loose, everything would fall apart. That's what this word consists means. By Him, all things are held together. And He is the head of the body, the church. Uh, church, the headquarters of the church, by the way, is not in Atlanta. 
It's in heaven. Or wherever, or Utah, or wherever you want to go. He is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have what? The preeminence. He's talking about this Jesus. What he has just done is refuted every doctrine of Gnosticism just in a few verses in order to allow the people of God to have the freedom to understand that Gnosticism is a man-made religion and that Christianity is not a religion at all. You do know that the root word religion comes from the word superstition. And that's something we are so superstitious sometimes. That's what Paul said about them over in Mars before we preached in Mars Hill. Paul went into town and he said, Everywhere I go, man, there's an altar here to this God and that God and that God. I even found an altar to the unknown God. Man, you guys got all your bases covered. But I perceive you're very religious. That was his words. Very, very superstitious. Anyone have any questions?